I'd like for you to take your Bibles, turn to 2 Chronicles, if you would, chapter 7. I've had a message on my heart this week, and something that I want to share with whoever needs it. The, the message is mentioned in 2 Chronicles 7, 14. That's the key verse. And if you guys know me well enough to know, I'm not going to just give you one verse and, and then preach for 50 minutes and not mention another one. I've got a lot of verses here. I'm not going to keep you all that long today. Um, but I want you to hear the word of God this morning. I want you to pay attention to it. I want you to listen to it. This may not necessarily be for you today because with some people, when they come into God's house, they're ready to come into God's house. Meaning that they have prepared themselves not just physically by fixing the hair and putting on proper attire, which, by the way, I don't usually make too big a deal about what to wear in God's house, what not to wear in God's house. But I do believe that women ought to look like women, men ought to look like men, and I think everybody ought to dress modestly. And you're coming into a place where you're going to be in the presence of God. I don't ask that all men wear ties and suits. I do, just as a matter of respect for the pulpit that I stand in. I think it's proper attire. I refuse to wear a robe. Amen. Uh, I don't want that. That elevates the man behind the pulpit above everybody else. So if I said I'm going to wear a robe, then I'd have to get one for everybody else. You'd have to wear it too. But those that prepare themselves spiritually, that means that before they've come to church, they've spent time in prayer. They've spent time with the Word of God. If there's any, con any sins in their life, they have confessed those sins so that when it's time for the preaching of God's Word, and the preacher just happens to preach on sins that you've committed, you can at least say to your own conscience, my conscience is clear. 1 John 1, 9 tells us, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, does that only mean that if it's a sin we've never committed before, or does it include every sin? Every sin. God is a very merciful God. In fact, he says over and over, I'm rich in mercy. That means God has plenty of it to spend on anybody who needs it and anybody who wants it. But let's read 2 Chronicles chapter 7. Let's understand the importance of repentance. And I mean godly repentance. Godly sorrow. Not the repentance of this world where we say we're sorry somebody to just kind of smooth things over with them. But I'm talking about true repentance where we are begging God, God, please take this sin away from me, not just from the past that I've committed them, but from the future so that I don't commit them again. To obey is better than sacrifice. So 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. In fact, I'm going to have you do this. We don't do this very often because I always preach a lot of Verses, and I wouldn't want us to stand every time I preach the verse, but I'd like for you to stand. This was done in the days of Ezra. When Ezra stood behind a pulpit of wood, 
he, all he had done was open the book and the people stood and said, amen, amen. He hadn't even read it. They were already amen in it because they revered what he was going to do was read the very words of God and they stood out of respect for that. 2 Chronicles 7, 14, if my people... In fact, you can read this out loud with me if you want. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Now, do you agree with that? Say amen. <clears throat> you pray for me this morning while I preach. Father, I ask your blessings on the message. I pray, dear God, Lord, that nobody ends up ill, nobody ends up being sick today. Nobody has COVID, nobody has anything like it. And I pray, Heavenly Father, God, that you would just guide and bless these people. God, that you'd give them grace, that you'd give them help. Father, there may be somebody, there may be, Lord, you may have laid this message on my heart because you knew there would be somebody here today that they've been out in the backyard of sin. Not in the front yard where everybody can see them, but out in the backyard, out in the back room. Down in the basement. Away from everybody where nobody could see them. And they could get away with it. But God, you saw them. And you were there. And I pray, dear God, that if that's the case. And God, I, you, you are my witness today, God. I, I know of no one here today that I even think is guilty of that. So, Father, whatever guilt is laid on anybody today, Lord, let it not be guilt that I place on them, but let it be guilt that your Holy Ghost lays on them. If they repent because of something I said, Father, I don't want it to be that way. I want it to, I want it to be, Lord, where they repent because it's something you said to them. But, Father, teach us repentance. Teach us, God, that it is part of our salvation, not just when we got saved, but as we live this life dedicated and set aside for you, there will be times when we stray away from you. And I pray, dear God, that you would not let us rest until we have confessed our sins to you. Father, bless your word. Bless this word. Bless it, Lord, to all those who hear it. I pray, dear God, you would carry this message today from this place and spread it, Lord, literally to hundreds or thousands or ten thousands or millions of people. It doesn't matter to me. It's up to you. God, that you would spread this message abroad to those who need to hear it. Let somebody, Lord, who needs to be convicted, be convicted today. Bless your word. It's the only thing that we have that connects us with you here on this earth. And its words are right and they're true. We ask your blessings on them in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, amen. You may be seated. Several years ago, <clears throat> as is the case, I, as I began to learn how the internet works like a lot of other people do, I began to find out that there were people out there that hated my guts. Uh, I don't know if you remember, but there, and I don't know exactly where the video is now, but when I... Shortly after I started, we started putting sermons on sermon audio, and I think after we started streaming, well, I, I sat down here in the sanctuary, 
and had some lights on me and I had a camera and I was just sitting there talking to the camera and I was explaining people how they could be saved. And I went through the Romans road, Romans 3.23, for all of sin to come short of the glory of God. Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death. The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Uh, Romans 10, 9 and 10, if we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, thou shalt be, seed, be saved. To, uh, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, for by grace are we saved through faith and that not of ourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And then I got to 1 John 1, 9. Turn to 1 John 1, 9, and if you don't know it, learn this verse, because somebody may come to you. God may send somebody to you. In fact, God may send somebody to you, maybe just to reveal to you that you actually don't know how to lead somebody to Jesus. And you might say within yourself, you know, I need to learn some Bible. 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins... He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I made that video, put it on the internet, and lo and behold, some Pharisees, legalist, crazy people accuse me of teaching people a works salvation and that if they listened to that, they could never be saved because I told them, that they had to repent and, that they, and they believed that you don't have to repent to be saved. I was just quoting scripture and I said, you need to repent of your sins. And they are of a mindset. They believe in this, in this thing. Pastor Jason Cooley, I like the way he put it. Once prayed, always saved. Which means if I can come to your house and... You're half drunk and I can talk you into praying a prayer and asking God to save you from that point forward, no matter what change, if any, is made in your life, you are guaranteed to go to heaven. You can go right back to drinking, right back to fornicating, right back to doing the same things you were, no change in your life whatsoever, and yet you're still going to heaven. That's the kind of people that accuse me of work salvation. I'm going, you people are nuts. So I decided to do the study. Number one, I was going to prove to these people how wrong they were, but I found out most of these people, you can't prove anything to them. But number two, to verify for myself, study the Bible, the Bible says. Study to show thyself approved. And I wanted to know whether or not it was true. Should we repent? If we want salvation, if we want eternal life, should we repent? Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 7. I've already got up on the screen, but I want you to open your Bible up. Will you please do that? And if I don't, if you don't do that, then I'll go turn the screen off. How would that be? And I'll instruct John not to put them on the screen either. 2 Corinthians chapter 12 verse or excuse me, chapter 7, verse 6. Nevertheless, God that comforteth those that are cast down, comforteth us by the coming of Titus, and not by his coming only, but by the consolation wherewith he was comforted in you when he told us your earnest desire, your mourning, your fervent mind toward me. What were they mourning? I believe they were mourning their sins. So that I rejoiced the more. For though, listen to this, verse 8. For though I made you sorry with a letter, Paul had written a letter to that church and he was chewing them out for the things that they had done wrong. And he anticipated that by the words that he was using, they would understand their error and that they would repent. Of that error. So he said. Um, For though I made you sorry with a letter. Verse 8. I do not repent. 
Though I did repent, for I perceived that the same epistle hath made you sorry, though it were but for a season. Now I rejoice, not that you were made sorry, but that ye sorrowed to what? Repentance. See, your children have learned to play a game with you. That if they say, I'm sorry, then maybe we won't punish them. See, I tried that on my mom. My mom was always six, seven steps ahead of me. Mom, I'm sorry. And to that, my mom would answer, you're going to be What did she mean by that? That I was fixing to be chased across the bed with a belt, trying to get away from that lash. When she was done, I really was sorry. And so he said, though I made you sorry with a letter, I do not repent. And he said, verse 9, now I rejoice not that you were made sorry, but that you were sorrowed to repentance, for you were made sorry after a godly manner, that you might receive damage by us in nothing. Now, verse 10, I want everybody in this room, I want us to read verse 10 out loud. Are you with me? Go. For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. Did you know that there are people who are in this world who feel sorrow and regret for the way that they lived their life and yet they have never, ever been brought to a God who can in fact forgive them and relieve them of the guilt that they've experienced. Brother Tim Barron's, in fact, he called me this morning. I have yet to return his phone call. I was getting ready. Tim Barron's told me he went to a town. Where was it? Br um, I think Breeze, New Mexico, or something, that's not the name. But it was a town in New Mexico that they had a lot of copper mines there, but the copper dried up, so they turned it into sort of, back in the 60s and 70s, they invited all the hippies and the druggies down from San Francisco and Los Angeles to come down there, and they would party down there, and they did. That, the town was filled with hippies, sodomites, magician practitioners, wicked practitioners, new age people. The town was full of it and still to this day is. 40% of the town's population is an admitted sodomite. And there are sodomite gay bars in this town. And Tim Barron's, God bless that man. He has no problem whatsoever going into a gay bar. And let me tell you how he does it. I don't know if he figured this out from experience. But he's, he told me, he said, Mike, if, if I go in these bars and I'm trying to give scripture to all the people in there, they catch me right away. They throw me out. But he said, as soon as I go into a gay bar, I go to the bartender and he's got a, a tract along with the DVD, and, and it's about suicide. And he goes to the bartender first, and he says, would you mind if I gave out to all your customers here uh, some things about suicide? Bartender, he's got them instantly. And he'll ask the bartender, he said, bartender, how many people in this bar have ever contemplated suicide? He said, every one of them. He said, they tell me everything. Some of them have attempted it and lived through it. 
Some of them have already been killed. And he said, I guarantee you, everybody in this bar has either committed it, tried to, tried to commit it, or know somebody who actually did. He said, you've got my blessing. You can pass that out. And basically, it's a, it's a video about suicide and a tract about suicide that deals specifically, I think, with sodomites. And he is allowed to hand out to every patron in that bar his gospel information about suicide. And he said, I've never been rejected one time. Because you know why? And, and by the way, he, he asked the bartender. He said, you know these guys in here. He said, how many of these guys in this bar were molested as children? He said, every one of them. So here you have a group of people who have been turned this way by an uncle, family member, next door neighbor. And then they've turned to live this lifestyle and they hate it. And they spend their life with worldly sorrow at how rotten their life is. But they very seldom have been introduced with love to the Jesus Christ who can rid them of their sorrow by giving them godly repentance. I love that man. God, God helped him figure this out. And he called me this morning. I suspect he wants us to pray for him. You pray for him this morning. His, him and his team of 20 are now going to go visit every state in the union with at least 10 to 20,000 tracts. They're going to hand out tracts in all 50 states in this country. So you pray for them. Amen. But there are people all around us who spend their life with regrets of things that they did to people that they've never been forgiven of, they've never, they've never been absolved of that sin, and they carry with them the guilt of that sin until the day they die. And that's what he's saying here. Godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. Which is why so many people who have done things to others and hurt them and know it, and they have to carry that around. That's why they end up killing themselves. That preacher I mentioned to you this morning during Sunday school, who was being investigated for molesting boys in his church and in his neighborhood. Maybe I misjudged him. Maybe I was thinking that he just wanted to escape the judgment of man. Or maybe it was the fact that he knew that he had done horrible things to some children and knew that probably he would never be forgiven of them. So he went out and blew his brains out. And what I'm here to tell you is, and don't tell you and to tell anybody online, you were never meant to carry the weight and the sorrow of your own sins. It'll kill you. Things you've done to other people, it'll kill you. It'll kill you. First Kings, turn there. This is King Solomon's prayer of dedication for the temple that he built. And I do believe King Solomon meant what he said here. 
Starting in verse 46, that's up on the screen, but I made it little enough to where you'd have to open your Bibles. While you're turning there, I'm, I'm just going to ask you this morning. Do you have things that you need to repent of? I'm not asking you to raise your hand. I'm not asking you to stand up and tell everybody. Because that's not, number one, it's not required. Number two, in most cases, it's not wise. But maybe there's somebody here. Or maybe there's somebody listening online that has things that they have done that they've not ever gotten God's forgiveness from. 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 46. Solomon prayed, If they sin against thee, for there is no man that sinneth not, and thou be angry with them and deliver them to the enemy so that, they can, so that they carry them away captives unto the land of the enemy far or near. Yet if they shall bethink themselves in the land whither they were carried to captives and repent and make supplication unto thee in the land of them that carried them captives, saying, We have sinned, we have done perversely, we have committed wickedness. And so return unto thee with all their heart and with all their soul in the land of their enemies which led them away captive and pray unto thee toward their land which thou gavest unto their fathers, the city which thou hast chosen and the house which I have built for thy name. Then hear thou their prayer and their supplication in heaven, thy dwelling place, and maintain their cause and forgive thy people that have sinned against thee and all their transgressions wherein they have transgressed against thee and give them compassion before them who carried them captive, that they may have compassion on them, for they be thy people and thine inheritance, which thou broughtest forth out of Egypt from the midst of the furnace of iron, that thine enemies may be open unto the supplication of thy servant and unto the supplication of thy people Israel to hearken unto them in all that they call for unto thee. And see, did you know that this exact thing Happened. Here's what Solomon said. Solomon said, Father, if, if our people, they get into so much sin that you have to do what you promised them to do, that you have to take them away into a land of captivity. If when they get in that land and they are sorry for what they did and they cry unto you and repent of their sins and turn from them, then God, will you then cause compassion on their captors over them and allow them to be released and come back to this city, to this place, to this holy mountain and so that they can be restored to the land of their nativity, the land that belongs to them. God, will you give that back to them? And God said, yes, I'll do it. That is exactly what happened. Once Judah ended up in Babylonian captivity for 70 years. All of a sudden, they began to cry out unto God. They were sorry for their sins. And God brought revival to them. And God even allowed the king who was over them to have compassion on them and release them and let them go back. And when they found out the temple was destroyed, he even allowed them to bring back all the things that, that pertain to the temple and allowed them to rebuild the temple. You see, that's part, let me just throw this in. Part of being forgiven is God giving you the allowance to rebuild what you destroyed with your old sin. Somebody Amen. Because what had happened, when God took them out of the land, Nebuchadnezzar, he stole all the stuff out of that temple and they burned it down to the ground. There was nothing left of it but the foundation. In fact, no, the foundation was gone too. They had to rebuild the foundation. To me, one of the greatest things that I've ever seen God do in my life 
was after I sinned, after I confessed, after I repented, and God knew I was serious, He let me rebuild my life. God will do that. Now, that also is part of the consequence of our sin is that when we do sin, destruction always follows that sin. The fact that after they left, when they came back, the temple was still sitting there gleaming just as bright as it was. It wasn't going to be that way. God was going to teach them a lesson. Rebuild it. I told you this story years ago. I was having a rough, rough, rough time in our church. This was back, I'm going to say probably 16, 17, 18 years ago. And I had um, built what I thought was the best closet hangers that anybody could ever build and I put all my clothes up there and then all the stuff on top of the shelves and I mean I had it full of stuff I worked on it for weeks come home one day and my closet vomited everything in it out into the floor in the room that was in spewed it all out and I sat there, and I, here I am, i got to work on a sermon. This is a Saturday, i got to work on a message. And I'm so mad, I'm sitting there in my chair staring at that mess. And I'm going, I ain't cleaning it up. I ain't doing it. After a while, God started dealing with me. God said, Mike, in reality, what are you going to do? Well, I guess I'm going to have to pick all that junk up. Yes. And then, Mike, what are you going to do? Well, I guess I have to rebuild the closet. Yes, Mike. And how are you going to do it? And I knew what God was getting at. And I said, stronger than it was the last time. So after that, and I wrote a message on that, preached it the next day. And I got home that night, and I started the process, cleaning the mess up. And I built me a Fort Knox closet. And this thing has held, you ought to see the amount of shirts, jeans, pants, Christmas stuff, stuff I've collected over the years, sitting in there in that closet. And that's been, like I say, about 16, 17 years ago. And I still keep hanging brand new stuff on it. It ain't give an inch. And see, that's the thing about God allowing you repentance. Is that even though some of the things you did destroyed things that you had going. One of the best things that God could ever do for you is to allow you to rebuild it better than it ever was before. Somebody say amen to that. Turn to Psalm 32. Now, when I'm saying repentance... I'm telling you two things. Number one, if possible, if possible, repent to the person you sinned against, if possible. Now, sometimes that may not be possible. Or sometimes... They don't want to see you ever again. 
Now, if God eventually wants to bring it around, he will. But if possible, you repent to the people that you hurt, that you sinned against. But number two, that's not enough. If man forgives your sin, it is a sign that God will forgive your sin, but you still have to repent to God. Because as David said in Psalm 51, against thee and thee only have I transgressed. And he was talking about his sin with Bathsheba. He could not apologize to Uriah the Hittite because he had him killed. The only person left to repent to was Almighty God. And he did. And did God forgive him? In fact, hold your place there in Psalm 32 and turn to Psalm 51. Let's read through this. Psalm 51. This is after, and if you notice the little heading before this, to the chief musician, a psalm of David, when Nathan the prophet had come unto, after he had gone into Bathsheba. David writes his confession out, and he says, Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according unto the multitude of thy tender mercies, Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly. That means totally and completely. From mine iniquity. And cleanse me from my sin. Now, do we have a record after this of David ever committing adultery again? No, we don't. Verse 3, for I acknowledge my transgression and my sin is ever before me. In the form of the wife that he married, Bathsheba. I'm sure he loved her. By the way, Bathsheba, that, let's, let, me, let me give you a little example of how good God is to us when we repent. Even though the sword never left his house after that. He had, his, he had one of his sons rape his daughter. He had Absalom killing the son who raped his daughter. Absalom then tried to take over his dad's throne there is a constant war in David's family. But did you know that after he married Bathsheba, she had another child that lived? Do you know who that child was? Solomon. The greatest, wisest king to ever live on this earth, aside from Jesus Christ. God gave David the best son that anybody could have ever asked for. Gave him Solomon. And that was through Bathsheba. So when you sin and when you destroy things, the first baby that Bathsheba got pregnant with died. The first temple that Solomon built after the sins of Judah had them carried away into captivity. They burnt that temple down, destroyed it completely. But did you know what God said was going to happen after that? That he said the temple is going to be rebuilt and he said the glory of this latter house is going to be greater than the first house. You think about that. The glory that was Solomon was far greater than the first son that David and Bathsheba brought into this world. 
That's how good God is to you when you will confess and repent of your sin. Somebody say amen. He said, wash me thoroughly from mine iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against thee, thee only, have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight. That thou mightest be justified when thou speakest and be clear when thou judgest. Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden part thou shalt make me to know wisdom. That's the places where nobody can see. Nobody else knew about David's sin except David. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness, that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. Hide thy face from my sins and blot out all mine iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation and uphold me with thy free spirit. Then will I teach transgressors the ways, thy ways, and sinners shall be converted unto thee. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, thou God of my salvation, and my tongue shall sing aloud of thy righteousness. O Lord, open thou my lips, and my mouth shall show forth thy praise. For thou desirest not sacrifice, else would I give it. Thou delightest not in burnt offering. The sacrifices of God, listen to this, are a broken spirit and a broken and a contrite heart, O God. Thou wilt not despise. Now, let me say something to you. Does anybody know how long it was? Here, David, he sees Bathsheba, commits adultery with her. She's pregnant. He brings Uriah home. Uriah won't go into his wife. He sends Uriah out, has him killed in the battlefield. He then takes Bathsheba to his wife. Bathsheba, nine months later, has the baby. The baby dies. And several months later then, Nathan the prophet came along. Now, the way I had, had figured it, I don't remember the exact numbers on it, but from the time David sinned with Bathsheba and Uriah, a year had gone by. A year had gone by. And what happens with people is that they sin sins and they expect that, well, since God didn't kill me or God didn't do this and God didn't do that, I guess I got away with it. And then we think after about a year that God got over it. And let me tell you something. God never gets over it. There's people who have sinned in their teenage years, young adult years, midlife years, and by the time they're 70 or 80 years old, they think, well, everybody else has forgot about it. I forgot about it. My wife's forgot about it. God's forgotten about it. I guess I'm home free. And you need to remember that once God writes your sin down in a book, it never goes away. But that's the mistake that some people make is that they think that if I just give it enough time and God doesn't do anything about it, then obviously God has gotten over it. That is a huge mistake. Because usually by then, we're not even sorry for it anymore. And that's dangerous. That's dangerous. Now back to Psalm 32. Psychiatrist, psychologist, when they analyze you, they got you in your chair, and they start talking to you, now tell me what you did in your childhood. 
tell me about this, tell me about that. And they will say to you, well, I've detected your problem already. Your problem is you're harboring guilt. You won't let things of the past go. And you need to get rid of that guilt. You need to just let that go. And over and over they will tell them, guilt is bad for you. Oh, shame, you shouldn't be ashamed. Oh, that's terrible for you. Your problem is you need to get over that. No, let me tell you something. Shame and guilt are your best friend. Best friend. Because look at Psalm 32. Uh, I have verse 3 up on the screen, but I want to read verse 1, so open your Bible up there. Blessed is he, and I'm going to hold fingers up here because you know I'm going to count something. Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Do you believe that God covers your sins so that it never can be brought back to mind again, as far as God's concerned? Blessed is the man unto whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity and in whose spirit there is no guile. In other words, you are not going to lie about it. God talks about those who've made lies their refuge. In other words, well, I'm going to try to cover this up. And if anybody asked, I wasn't there. I didn't do this. I wasn't part of that. What? And you get others to lie for you too. I'll back him up. Oh yeah, he was nowhere here. He was someplace else. Yeah. No, he couldn't have done this. And you'll lie about it. And you want other people to lie about it for you. You've made lies your refuge. And I'm here to tell you, God's not going to tolerate that. God's going to expose you. But he says four things here. Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man unto whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no guile. You're not going to lie to God. You're going to tell him the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Now notice he says in verse 3, When I kept silence, my bones waxed old through my roaring all the day long. You couldn't hold it in. Guilt. Why is it when cops see a carload of people at 3 o'clock in the morning and they pull them over, and they walk up to the window and all of a sudden everybody's shaking like this. What is that? It's guilt. They're afraid that the cop is going to detect something and they will find the drugs in the car. Well, the first thing the cop was looking for is, here's my license. Cops will look for this vein right here. And they can actually see it going bloom, 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 like that. Sweat pouring down it. Why are you sweating so much? Oh, it's hot. It'd be 40 degrees outside. When I kept silence, my bones waxed old through my roaring all the day long. For day and night thy hand was heavy upon me. My moisture is turned into the drought of summer. See, Selah, here's, here's what God, if God loves you the way he loves me anyway, he loves his people, the Holy Ghost will press down on you and make the weight of your sin so heavy that you can't bear it anymore. How many of y'all know that's true? Say amen. So then he said, verse 5, I acknowledge my sin unto thee, and mine iniquity have I not hid. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord, 
and thou forgavest the iniquity of my sin. Selah. For this, and here's what I want you to do. I want you to underline the word godly. For this shall everyone that is godly pray unto thee in a time while, when thou mayest be found. You know what that indicates to me? That there is a time when you won't be able to find God even though you go searching for him. Who believes that? Say amen. God offers you a time to repent. And God always knows the truth about you. He always knows the outcome. And I promise you, Jesus even said it of Jezebel in the book of Revelation, chapter 3. He said, I cast that Jezebel and I gave her a space to repent. And she never did. Therefore, I'm not going to forgive her. For this shall everyone that is godly pray unto thee in a time when thou mayest be found. Surely in the floods of great waters they shall not come nigh unto him. For thou art my hiding place. Thou shalt preserve me from trouble. Thou shalt compass me about with songs of deliverance. Now I want everybody to look up to me. Look up at me. In fact, I'm going to do this. I'm going to come down here. That last thing that he said here, and I got to find it. Thou art my hiding place. Thou shalt preserve me from trouble. Thou shalt compass me about with songs of deliverance. So let me ask you a question. Is there anything too bad that God won't forgive? Now, we know that the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, we're laying that aside. Does God forgive murderers? Does God forgive drunkards? Even drunkards who've killed people in accidents, does God forgive them? Sure he does. And let me tell you something. To anybody who's ever done that, taken somebody's life while you were drunk behind the wheel, without God, you will never be able to forgive yourself. Is God able to forgive a woman who's cast her child in abortion? And let me say this, without God, you will never be able to forgive yourself. Does God forgive a man who's defiled his marriage? Yes. Does God forgive women who defile their marriage? In fact, is there a sexual perversion that God won't forgive? No. Paul talked to, I can't remember what the church it was, but he mentioned some of you had been effeminate. But now you've washed. Now you've been cleansed. That's the way you used to be. But now God has brought you out. I'm here to tell you that God is able to forgive even the worst of those kinds of offenders. And I will say this, you will never, ever be able to forgive yourself without knowing that God has forgiven you. That's called having a clean conscience 
now. So with that in mind, um, I'm not going to I'm not going to ask you to come down unless you want to. But I'm going to ask everybody to bow their head. And I want to ask, I want, I want to ask, I want you to think of the worst thing that you've done in life. And even though it's been forgiven and you believe that, ask God to forgive you again. Do you know there's nothing in the Bible that says you can't do that? I do it. Now I know I've already been forgiven. But sometimes the guilt of things I've done come back on me. And I just say to God, God, I really am sorry that I ever did that. And you know what that displays? A heart that wasn't just trying to do something wrong and then get away with it by confessing it to God one day. God knows and you know that you're still sorry over that. And you never want to go back that again, ever. So I'm going to give you a moment to confess your sins to God. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand because I already know that everybody here is a sinner. And it may be, it may be that you've done things this week That today, you need to ask God to forgive you. Father of the things that I've done. Since my first remembrances as a boy. Doing things that I knew even back then. They were wrong. God I wish I'd never done them. And I'm very sorry that I did. Things I did when I was a teenager. Things I did in my 20s. My 30s. Things that you started delivering me from, finally. Things that I've done 10 years ago. 15 years ago, five years ago, a year ago, two weeks ago, last week. Things that my family's done. God, I feel like Job. Father, I would pray, God, that you would visit their sin upon me so that I would know that my children's sins would be forgiven. I'd take it. I don't want my children to die and go to hell. I don't want my grandchildren to die and go to hell. I don't want anybody in this church to 
die and go to hell. I don't want anybody listening online. Die and go to hell. All of those people that we give food to. Father, if we love them enough to feed them corn and beans. Then, Father, I love them enough to ask you to let them sit at your table in heaven. But, Father, whatever it takes, work godly sorrow in us. God, I saw you do it in my brother-in-law. And, Father, I knew him at a time when he hated me because he knew what I represented. But God, I saw you turn him around and make him truly sorry for every sin he ever committed. And Father, I've had people call me that were perverts, sodomites, liars. I've had people call me God that confessed all kinds of things to me. And I believe, God, that they truly repented to you. And I believe, God, that they're truly sorry. And I believe, God, that you truly forgave them. But Father, they need deliverance. Father, would you give it to them? Grant it to these people. If anybody in this church, God, done anything wrong, God, forgive them. Father, if anybody listening online has done anything wrong, Father, you would forgive them. If my family has sinned against you, God, please, would you forgive them? And they may have a life of rebuilding, but at least they got the second chance to do so. Father, help us to find those people, Lord, that need forgiveness. People like Bobby and others like him who don't know what it's like to truly be loved. Father, would you show us how to love him and many others, Lord, so that they would know, God, that they can be forgiven. Bless your people this morning. Dismiss them in your care and dismiss them, Father, with your mercy. We pray this in Jesus' name and all of God's people said, Amen. Are you glad you came to God's house this morning? Would you stand to your feet?